Um, Princeton chose to um, continue to not disclose the um, number of applicants just um, because they didn't want to deter um, potential students from applying as it may have seen um, a bit too competitive. Uh, if I could chime in, an important point to make is that even as these application numbers are rising, um, the class sizes for the most part are staying roughly the same, right? So the schools are not increasing their class size in most cases. So the comparison is becoming more competitive. Yeah. Quick question. Yes, what sir. happened uh, to you, Ben? Uh, why do they have more applicants in the last year? Any color on that? Uh, I think uh, there's probably a few factors in play. So UPenn is one of the institutions that uh, decide to be to continue the test optional policy. So still people can apply without the SAT. And also um, they have very strong uh, programs in terms of both engineering, computer science, data science, and also business. So those, those two programs still continue to be the most popular program okay. in the States. So that's why they, they have been continuing to attract a high number of applicants. Thank you. Um, forgot to mention that as well. Like uh, we, we welcome questions at any time. At but, any time. Yeah, at any yeah. time. But You're also we have a Q&A questions at the end of the, the, um, the presentation for both everyone in the room and also people joining the Zoom. Uh, and then on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that the admission rate for these um, institutions remains steadily at a very competitive level. So some institutions will be around 3%, while some will be around 7 to 8%. Okay, so we have been seeing this low number for about two to three years now. It's been creeping down steadily year on year, right? Um, and one factor to consider is that if a student does in fact get admitted into Harvard, for example, uh, the odds are pretty decent that they might have gotten into yeah, Princeton or, or Yale. Yeah. So the pool is actually even narrower than the numbers themselves suggest. Okay, but it's not all doom and gloom. There we go. <laughs> uh, just hope. on the lighter side of things, uh, we still continue to see very um, amazing results from our students. All right, so now we're going to move on and talk about some of just the larger trends, uh, the big changes that we've seen, uh, beginning with the pandemic, but which have continued on since over the past few years. Um, as we have already mentioned, the overall application volume has increased significantly. And interestingly, even since the pandemic has kind of eased out, that that trend is continuing and we anticipate it to do so in the future. Um, one thing to notice as well, if you look here, it's not only the sheer number of students that are applying that is increasing, but also the number of schools that students are applying to. As we can see here um, for 2022, 2023, uh, the average is five schools, which surprised me because most of our students, we would recommend 10 schools as a minimum, right? Um, and often 10 to 15 in their schools a lot. But as we can see, as more students apply, um, the competitiveness is going to increase as well. Um, and here we kind of dissected it down to see where the, uh, the amount was increasing from. So we can see that while um, domestic students, American students, uh, there has been some increase at 17% since um, COVID has started. Uh, but the majority of the increase actually came from internationals. So um, in the last four or five years, the number of international applicants has increased by 45%. And um, the main nations that these applicants came from, well, the top one continues to be China, followed by India, Nigeria, Ghana, and Canada. However, for students applying from Thailand, um, they're not necessarily competing directly with students from China, for example. Um, that being said, uh, regional countries, Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam, right, for example, Malaysia, Philippines, they're going to be put into a pool 
Um, these are not official quotas. The universities don't necessarily say it, right? Um, but they do try to keep a balance, a regional balance in their acceptance. And, and when they separate students into pools, um, so let's say you mentioned earlier, if um, let's say a Thai um, uh, applicant uh, coming from Thailand and versus another um, Thai uh, student, let's say um, coming from the US, uh, would they be put in the separate pools or? Uh, well, there is a slight overlap between those two pools in terms of nationality. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say the, the context in which the students come from. So for example, if it's a Thai-based international school versus a boarding school in the US, that pool is going to be stronger and playing uh, a larger uh, kind of influence on how the student will be um, assessed and determined by the university. To build on what you said earlier about a student, an American citizen who is Thai educated, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they have a certain advantage because they have a unique background, right? Culturally. Um, at the same time, a Thai student that has come through the American system, gone to an American boarding school, that's also an advantage because it shows that they've been in that system, they come from that system, and often the universities are more familiar to the schools that they're coming from. So a lot of it's unique to each candidate, right? And getting them the right position is quite critical. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about standardized tests. So um, as the majority of the school continues to adopt the test optional policy, we uh, foresee that this is going to continue the confusion for applicants. And this is because while around 90% um, say that they are test optional, Past results have shown that students who choose to submit test results still are at an advantage compared to those who don't. So if we take a look here, Notre Dame um, admitted two out of three students who submitted test scores. Uh, Wellesley, 60% uh, of the students accepted chose to submit scores. And UVA, 70% accepted choose to submit that test scores. So um, yeah, while they say that SAT you can submit or not, um, Usually, most of the schools still prefer if the students submit a strong test score. Uh, that being said, we really do recognize that there is a strong correlation between a strong SAT score and a good school GPA, right? So it can be kind of inferred that if you submit your test score, it's probably high, and therefore your GPA at school is probably also very good as well. So here we're looking at a strong pool of applicants for sure. But um, our strategy is that we would like the student to try for the SAT first and see how they do on the test. If they do indeed get a strong score, then of course submitting it would be like a bonus point to your application. But if they don't, that's totally okay. We will just choose not to submit it and just run with the student's GPA. But there is definitely no harm in submitting a strong score. And to uh, boil that down a little bit at these more extremely competitive universities, uh, the test scores are going to play a factor because imagine if you have two applicants that have a lot of great activities, very similar profiles, right? Applying from the same country and the school is looking for a way to differentiate them and one submits the test score and one does not, right? Um, so it's another piece of information. So test optional, is not always, is not always. Now that the SAT subject tests have been phased out, right, uh, there are still the AP exams. Um, one thing to know is that you do not necessarily have to have taken the AP class to take the AP exam. That being said, the APs are extremely challenging, right, harder than the SAT, I would say. Um, secondly, they only happen once a year. So you have to plan well in advance, right? Uh, but AP exams are a great way to kind of bolster yeah. your application um, and to show that you're prepared for an American, uh, the American university system. How many AP um, grades or um, you would recommend for a strong applicant? Oh, 
going to give the annoying answer. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it really depends on, on multiple factors. So first of all, if your child or the student comes from a, a very well recognized curriculum already, so for example, if he or she is doing IP or A level, then the answer would be the student doesn't need AP at all because those two curriculum are already enough to, mm -hmm. to tell them about their academic abilities. Um, second scenario, if the student is already in a school that uses AP system, then how many APs would be based on the average number of APs the students do at the school? So let's say, for example, um, the school on average, the student does three to four APs throughout high school. Then we would say a good number would be somewhere above that. So they want to show that they are above average from where the environment that the student comes from. So the, the student might choose to take five or six AP, for example, or even up to 10 if they are very capable. An alternative approach is, for example, if the student is very, very interested in a particular area, if they're strong in a particular subject, then they could take fewer APs, but focusing on those subjects that they really want to concentrate on in high school, right? Um, but as Mew said, some go for eight to 10, right? And others go for two to three, use different options. Yes. And if you come from a school that doesn't use the AP system at all, then I would say just take the APs in the subject that strongly relates to what you want to study in college. So let's say if you want to do computer science, then perhaps you want to see some sort of calculus related AP or maybe computer science AP or physics. Yeah. Right, um, the, the A level is considered um, as to be the same level as the AP. So if the, the student is already doing A level exams at their school, then there is no need to do the APs at all. And then this A level score can be used to, to um, submit to the universities. The A levels, uh, IB HL classes and AP classes are all considered uh, roughly the same in terms of like the level of challenge and how the university is for you. Okay. Good news. Yes, some, some good news. So I know we've said that many of the colleges still value standardized tests, but there is a different group of universities who really are test optional or even um, as far as you say as being test blind. So an example, we have Florida. Over half of the class admitted last year did not submit test scores. And not only that, for the University of California, so the similar names of Berkeley and LA and San Diego, they have continued to adopt a test line policy, meaning that even if the student choose to submit their SAT score, it wouldn't be considered as part of the application. Uh, we also see a similar message from Cornell this year. So currently Cornell has three colleges which are test blind. So that's the Cal, so College of um, Agricultural Sciences. So this includes majors like uh, biology, food science, um, biochem, also the College of Art architecture and the College of Business have declared to be test blind. So even if you send them, they wouldn't see the, the score. Yeah, so there is still some uh, ways around it. If the student doesn't have a test score, uh, they can choose to not send it to test optional school and they can choose to apply to test blind schools as well to increase their chances. And also when you're putting together your college list, right? It's good to have a mix, right? Depending on your student's background, and there is a completely different school of thought here in the case that um, some universities are now beginning to be SAT mandatory again. Um, so following from last year, MIT and Georgia Tech has decided to announce that they will now require SAT again. We have seen uh, a couple of notable names follow that trend as well. Um, so mainly for you this year, you would have to submit test scores if you want to apply, and also Georgetown. So one of the, another big change uh, some of you might be aware of, uh, this has always been around, but it's becoming much more common, is early decision. Uh, for those of you that don't know, early decision, you apply early. Uh, usually around November, late October, early November. Um, and if you get in, it is binding. 
So you have to go to this school. Uh, the good news for early decision is you hear back early in De December, January, right? Um, which takes a lot of pressure off of your student. But more importantly, um, if the student does have a better chance of admission, especially at these more competitive institutions. One thing to think about is that these schools, schools like UPenn and Brown, they're not just uh, choosing the students, but they're also competing with each other for particular students, right? So they like early decision because it's a binding, it's a binding commitment. And these numbers, these numbers are actually quite shocking, as you can see, right? Uh, for Barnard, which is a, a girls' school, but affiliated with Columbia, my older sister went there, she loved it, 62% um, of its class was admitted. So think about how much smaller the pool is for the students applying in the regular term. Um, and we see that for other schools as well, UPenn, Brown. So identifying the early decision school early, right, in time, getting the application materials in time, um, this is becoming more and more important. Yes. So um, you mentioned about the um, low admission rate, uh, acceptance rate earlier. How does this work with the, or interact with the acceptance rate, um, which is calculated um, and shown? Uh, the, the acceptance rate is calculated as the whole amount of students applied that year. Including ED? Including ED, including yes. the Um, however, uh, they have, this is a relatively new development. We also have ED2, which basically works the same as early decision, except the application time would be the same as regular decision, uh, which is January 1st, sometimes mid-January. Um, but uh, normally for regular decision, we would hear back in April, thereabouts. Uh, ED2 applicants will hear mid-February, mid-February yeah. or so. Uh, there's a variety of reasons you might do ED2. Uh, number one is, for example, for your early decision school, if you just don't feel that you have the right test scores, you have some activities, you want to strengthen your application during that time, um, you could carry it over and apply it to instead. Uh, another option is, Usually students have one dream school, but if you have a second dream school that you definitely want to go to 100%, right? Um, ED2 would be an option. And you will, once again, get a bit of an advantage, a bit of an edge over the students that apply for a third decision. I see this as like a second chance if you, worst case, get rejected from your ED1 choice, or if you, get, you got deferred from your ED1 meaning that they want to consider you along the uh, regular round pool. Uh, ED2 gives you a second shot to be committed to another school and boost your chance. So uh, the University of California system, uh, historically, we recommend that most students should try applying to this system, not simply because of its overall level of quality, uh, Berkeley, UCLA, uh, also because it's one application one straightforward application. And through that, you can apply to all of the schools within the system, right? Uh, so it's a great way to have a safety net, right? Um, to potentially get some safeties. Uh, basically it's 10 for one, right? That being said, that being said, um, there have been some major changes to the UC system lately, right? Uh, one of them being that the number of applicants or the number of acceptances has gone down significantly, particularly for out-of-state and international students. Well, this, uh, that was a law that was recently introduced um, based on the fact that housing prices has been going through the roof in California. So the state has come out and say that uh, for the state university, so all of the University of California, they would have to limit the number of out-of-state students that they can accept. So this would include anybody from outside of California and also us internationals. So um, with that rule being put in place, we have seen uh, 
a decline in the number of international students that the school have accepted over the past couple of years. Uh, in the most recent years, you can see that the number has dropped quite sharply. Um, most notable one would be UC San Diego, where the number of international has dropped by almost half. So it is true that the UC is becoming increasingly competitive. So while we do, um, as Ravi suggested, while we encourage students to apply to the UC, we want them to be aware, um, aware that these things are going on and that if they do choose to submit the application, it's best to target a few UC schools just to diversify their chances. So not just hitting the big ones like Berkeley and LA, but also considering other very well um, established UC um, campuses like Davis or worldwide. I often make the point that it is a single application. So there's no harm whatsoever in just checking a box. It's about $40, I think, for each application. So if you're going to apply for one, might as well apply for all. Okay, the big question, the big question. So as you probably all know, one of the big developments recently has been ChatGPT, um, which I would imagine students are already using for homework, homework essays, <laughs> right? Research assignments. So the big question is how is this going to affect college admissions, right? Uh, as you probably know, uh, historically, a huge part of this process has been the essays, uh, both what we call the personal statement, which is a, a, a statement that the student communicates who they are, what motivates them, supplemental essays, right? Um, whereas now, this can be done with an AI. So how is this going to affect the application process? First thing, I will point out is in my own work, I've had a few students attempt like be like, Robbie, here's my writing. And I'll look at it and I could be like, chat GPT wrote this, right? Um, and this will be true for the readers as well. Um, it's still pretty clear under the current, the current <coughs> software at yeah. least, whether it's been written by a human or a program. On top of that, as Mew found out, um, they are, colleges are currently developing software to detect it, right? This is a major point because if Americans take, American universities take plagiarism extremely seriously, so if the essay raises that red flag, the rest of the application will probably not even be considered whatsoever. Now, how do we respond to this? Because even if our students do not use ChatGPT, Overall, there's probably going to be quite a few applicants that do, right? Um, colleges, one way colleges might respond would be rather than looking simply at written materials, right? They want to see other evidence that will back up or support the application. We're going to talk a bit more about this when we discuss activities, but there's many ways, uh, videos, right? Um, like Brown and Chicago and Babson currently make video submission part of the application. To introduce yourself, introductory yeah. videos, uh, research. So that can be like if your student has, or my, my student has done like a research paper, some kind of writing that can be independently verified, right? Artifacts, this is like portfolios if they're into photography, right? And then finally, the interview process, which is a conversation in the world. Uh, another point I'd like to make, because I really like to focus on this part, is if in the past you could write a beautiful sounding essay with a beautiful narrative, you know, um, which was a real treasure to have, but not everyone can do that. You just tap it into the machine, right? So what are colleges going to be looking for? It has to be well written, but underneath that there has to be a story, there, the content is going to become more and more important. So not how beautifully do you say it, but what are you saying and how can you back that up? So the tone of the essays is going to change quite a bit. Having an authentic voice and also having, having like multi layers to your stories, having uh, complex realizations as part of your story would make your essay stand out amongst the other one with uh, all flowery languages. 
So to summarize for the moment, we would recommend treating chat GPT with great caution. All right, so major things to think about as we're coming into this new round of admissions, right? Um, as Mew has pointed out, uh, testing is ambiguous. The SATs, the APs, it's all a bit unclear, right? Uh, so the grades, just the basic grades in the classes at school have become more important than ever before. Um, as we can see, a lot of these universities, they do want well-rounded applicants. They want applicants with a wide range of activities. But beneath that, the numbers don't lie. 96% of all students are in the top 10% of their class at Brown. And I think you'll see that level pretty much across the Ivy League and at the more selective institutions. Is that another problem there in that uh, this class, probably 50% of those students are based on students, top 2%. So your class rank is, you know, you're number 14, but you're still miles ahead of everybody else. Is that going to disappear? That, in that case, they would look primarily at the transcript. So it's not necessarily the percentile um, within the class that's the deciding factor. So if the grades are solid in and of themselves, that means that the grades that would confirm that. Mm -hmm. that would be okay. yeah, so if everyone is performing at an A star level, so uh, the universities will also look at other things, for example, subject combination. So some A-levels are known to be diff more difficult and more challenging than others. So it's the student taking those difficult classes and also other classes that he's taking um, related to what he wants to study in college. So that would be taken into consideration. And if everyone is performing at a very similar level, um, everyone always like half of the class is performing at a very high level, then of course the next thing that the college would look at would be um, the SAT score and also the profile of the students. But a key point to keep in mind, because universities, uh, especially IVs and well-known schools, they have such a mass volume of applications every year. So, and they do not have time to read every essay, to go into detail for every little bit, right? Um, so often, the first cut is quite simply the grades, right? Um, as we can see at, with Emory, for example. Um, and this is where other factors like the SATs come. Question about grades. Yes, sir. So uh, in the American system, uh, if you take AP um, classes, you usually get extra uh, points, yeah, like right? weight at GPA. Right? Yeah, you know, for the GPA. Mm -hmm. How would you map? I think the um, the grade from um, standard classes and the um, the AP classes, the honor or honor classes. Okay, so um, when you submit your GPA as part of your application, the system will clearly ask if this GPA is weighted or not weighted, mm -hmm. right? So the the school will know uh, which system the student comes from, and then. The system, uh, the, the student will be compared amongst the other schools who are uh, using similar systems. Yeah. So it's not to say that the student who goes to an unweighted school is at a disadvantage. But comparing to maybe students in the same school in the let's say U.S. system, I think one student take let's say uh, um, a math class or an English class um, got an an, an A in the normal class yeah. and got an A minus, let's say in an AP class. Uh -huh. how, how would you compare those two um, um, applicants? Well, the, the advice I give students when they're choosing, when they're choosing their courses, right, is it's generally better to get a good grade in a standard level class, right, than to do, do really poorly in a higher level class, but right? But A minus, uh, poor? An or... A minus and an AP is certainly not poor. No. Okay. And uh, the question is how you map between those, I mean, and how you kind of, where do you cut off? Uh, Maybe is B, B minus poor, B plus okay, A minus okay, good, uh, or? That would be 
in that case, um, the context in which where the student comes from will really play a significant um, role. So when the school submit the application for the student, they will need to include this um, document called the school profile. Mm -hmm. And as part of the school profile, um, the school has to include facts like average score um, during the past class. Um, so in that case, the student would be compared to the rest of his peers mm -hmm. to see if he's performing at a higher level, at the same level, or at a below average level. Yep. So even if he's taking a more difficult class, mm -hmm. but if he's performing at a lower level compared to his classmates overall in terms of GPA, then that wouldn't look so great. Yeah, so as, as Ravi mentioned, only take the more difficult classes if you are confident that you can kind of pull up your GPA with that class. So um, if you were to compare A minus from AP class and, and, and A from a normal class, which one would uh, be better? We keep going with the it depends answer, <laughs> okay, but depends, yes, okay. it very much depends on the class and the mean, situation. If, but an A minus and an A, mm -hmm. um, the distinction, I would say an A minus and an AP class. Yeah. AP classes are, I don't know if any of you ever took them, are, are quite challenging. They're pitched at, they say it's the undergraduate yeah. level, yeah. Um, depending on the teacher, but um, it is a big step up for the students. So being able to get an A in an AP class or multiple AP classes, um, and especially a four or a five on the exam, which is an external exam, not with the school, is does play a huge role in the college admissions uh, process. Oh, yes. yeah. So let's say if either the student um, has been offered, uh, whether he or he uh, choose either a normal class or the AP class or the AS or other class, what that that makes them um, pass? Um, they should go for the, the difficult one, right? If they feel up to it, if they're even they not sure because it's in the future, they should go for it first, right? No matter what um, the result is, they should go for it. No, uh, we still prioritize having good grades overall. And then if they are doing well, then the next question would be, should they take more difficult classes? Right. So my, my recommendation to the student would be, uh, they should talk to the teachers who, who is going to be teaching that advanced class mm -hmm. to see if they think with the current performance that the student is doing, would he or she be performing at an okay level in that class? So if, if, if the, um, that teacher offer Mm. If, if, if the teacher thinks that uh, the student is up to the class um, level, then yes, I think that the student should challenge themselves. But again, um, he or she has to balance it quite well. So it's not to say that he should take advanced classes in all of the subjects, right? Only choose the ones that he thinks he will be performing well, and also ones that might be related to what he wants to study. So there might be no point in, t um, in taking like an honors class in literature if he doesn't want to do. Um, he wants to study engineering. Yeah, if he wants to study engineering. In my experience, AP teachers are usually pretty supportive and they will tell the student if they feel that they are ready, right? Or if it might be too challenging. Also that you can research beforehand. Um, the AP curricula, the exam is for any subject covers pretty specific topics, right? So before you enroll for the class, you can get a sense of, will I be capable of this, right? What support will I need if I decide to do it? Um, just to address maybe people from the Thai curriculum, mm -hmm. if you choose to take the AP and ended up not doing so well on the exam, then that's completely okay. We can just choose not to submit the score and, and the colleges will not know that exactly what happened. All right, so that being said, so the academics, the grades are at the core of the application, but one of the major distinctions between the British system, for example, which looks primarily almost entirely at your grades, your record, uh, American universities still very much value the profile. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we mean by profile? So if you take a look at this scatter graph here, we'll see um, the stats of applicants applying for a computer science major like the other. 
uh, we can see that on the far um, left hand corner of the graph that we uh, that the school got a lot of very top performing students, both in terms of that school GPA and also that SAT score. But you'll see a mix between red and green dots, meaning that the only thing is distinguishing between these top performing students would be that profile. Right? So for top colleges, having just good grades is not going to make the cut, but you have to show a strong, compelling profile as well. If I could put a small point here, though, um, just add on to that. You might, you guys might know Carnegie Mellon. Their computer science program is, I would say, top, top, yeah, the top, three. Three. top three in the country. Yeah. So this is an extremely competitive program to begin with, right? So what the question to ask is, what is that added value that got those students up in the top far right mm -hmm. across the? Like All right. What are the greens and the reds? Oh, acceptance oh. and rejection. Oh, oh. Yes. Um, there's a website. Uh, yes. Um, N i c h e niche dot com. I strongly recommend it. Um, they have a lot of data yeah. about schools, acceptance rates, things like this. Our guess is that these are probably perhaps like athletes who has been recruited. Um, for a sports scholarship, or perhaps they are professional musicians yeah, who's been recruited through a completely different track to a normal student. There's also the rare case of a student that came from, for example, extremely unconventional circumstances. You know, maybe they were born in West Africa and they taught themselves English and somehow managed to take the SATs and Maybe they didn't have the best grades, but they're a compelling candidate regardless, right? So we all stop that kind of idea. Okay, so what makes a useful or a meaningful activity, right? Um, all students do things outside of their classes, um, but things that we look for, level of commitment. This is why we recommend starting very, very early. Uh, it's okay at the end of the day to do an internship the summer of your junior year, right? That being said, it's much better if the activity begins early in the first or second year of high school and you build it, you grow it over time, right? Intellectual curiosity. Um, what motivated you to do this, right? How does it link to what you want to study in university? What is creative about it? Another factor, very, very key, initiative, leadership. So it's not just being, whenever a student tells me like, oh, I'm a member, I'm a member of this organization, right? And I'm like, oh, that's great. What do you do? What have you done, right? So we want to see impact, especially ideas or initiatives that the student themselves started within the group, right? Entrepreneurial spirit. And then finally, a lasting outcome. So I don't like to think of activities as just one set little thing that you did and then presented to the university. It's more of a stepping stone. You grew it, grew it a little bit more. You either passed it on to underclassmen to grow, but also think about ways that you could build it at school, at university, how to grow it, right? So we also look for scale. To sum all this up, uh, good activities must stand out, right? Um, they see a lot, so it really has to catch their attention. So in what forms can activities be? There are many, many different ways that the students can further explore their interests. For example, joining clubs at school. If there's any clubs that they really like, perhaps try to get a leadership position within the club. Uh, doing research, uh, initiating their own passion projects, doing internships, doing extra learning, like summer courses, online courses, um, joining competitions, doing community service with a community or group of people that they really care about, mm -hmm. and having extra hobbies of their own. Okay. So an example of a really fun activity that my student did last year was that he was really into cactus growing. So he manages his own greenhouse at home, devising like process and designs of how best he can take care of cactuses. Uh, he groomed a few and sent them to competition as well. Cactus competition? Yeah, cactus competition. <laughs> and um, in the end, he kind of spread that impact 
to others. So he found a rural school, went in and taught the students how to read your own taxes and how to um, groom them. And in the end, the student decided to follow his footsteps and grow some cactus and sold them for money, right? So you've got everything from commitment. Student has been doing it for years. Um, initiative, he initiated his own greenhouse system. He um, submitted his cactus for competition. He also found a school to teach at and long lasting outcome. So his students actually took his hobby and turned it into a, well, like a side job. I'll give another example. Uh, this might be quite a few I could pull, but one would be, this would be similar to a passion project. So I had a student who lived near the coastal coast of Thailand. I forget exactly, maybe Wahin or somewhere. And he heard about the dugongs. Do you guys know dugongs? They're kind of an endangered species that lives off the coast. Uh, many of them are choking on ocean waste, right? Uh, so what he did was he created image recognition software, which he then attached to a drone, which he had fly over the dugong's habitat in order to map their region, map their habitat, right? Um, and then he built these semi-autonomous boats, which communicated with the drones, which could then recognize garbage and waste and go out and collect it, right? Um, so he was able to combine environmentalism, with his interest in technology, research and development, right? But it didn't happen in a day. This whole project took him about two years, right? And it just started with his interest in protecting the Dukongs, right? So it's a good, something you can build over time. This is and for those who might uh, prefer maybe a less scientific projects, mm. uh, I've had a student who, who was really passionate about um, uh, racism, and um, human rights. So in the end, what she did was she created this platform to interview people who has gone through those sort of um, discriminations. So she's a really passionate interviewer, a really passionate writer. So she interviewed them, wrote articles, and then continued building, building on the website. So currently she has like over 100 articles and also 50 contributors, right? So it doesn't always have to be something um, very technical, very scientific. Start from the student's own passion and grow it from there. I like often, especially for students that are technical and scientific, if your child is interested in STEM, for example, it's good to balance that out with something a little bit creative. Mm -hmm. So for example, if they're into photography or writing or art, right? Um, it doesn't have to be, in fact, it's better if it's balanced and diverse, right? But a common thread that runs through all of these, and you kind of alluded to it, is it should not just be about the student themselves, but how can I take this to benefit others? How can I expand it outwards? That's a key element for most of these, right? Uh, generally, it's not just going to be one. Um, American universities ask for 10, right? Oh, you're just like, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> but that being said, uh, four to five pretty solid, well-developed ones. And some can be, I don't know, if you're part of a dance team. Yeah, or part of a sports team. Yeah. If you play an instrument, yeah, that could be part of your activities list as well. But it's been, the key point, I think, to take away from is to start early to start early and develop these over time and also to get a range. Another key point, once the student has done all the hard work, so they have got the grades, they have built on their activities, is in the end, you have to be strategic about how to put everything together on your application. Um, so this is kind of a side point. Uh, you guys might have noticed that a few names come up again and again, right? Stanford, uh, UPenn, NYU. Uh, one thing that's often overlooked about the United States is in any major, if you search uh, any school in the top, I would say 30, perhaps 40, it's going to be a pretty solid program in that field. So one thing to look for are kind of schools that are competitive, have great reputations, great resources, but might not necessarily be on the map in the same way. Right. Uh, one example of these, and I'm, I'm a product of this system, are uh, liberal arts schools. 
uh, liberal arts schools or colleges rather tend to be smaller, um, usually about 1,000 to 2,000 students. Um, they're interdisciplinary, so you'll take a wide range of courses, um, even though you will choose a major. Uh, however, the main difference is they are theory-based. So it'll be more about conceptual thinking, critical learning, right, as opposed to practical applications. Right? Uh, one of the great benefits of liberal arts schools that I, that I loved is just the small classes, right? Um, a typical class size would be about 10, eight to 10, and one-on-one -on -one contact with the professor from day one, right? Which is a huge advantage. Um, and there are certain schools, not all, uh, there are liberal arts schools like, for example, Williams or Amherst that are just as competitive as getting into Harvard, right? Um, that being said, there are other schools Oh, that breaks my heart. That was Vassar was my dream school. I got waitlisted. Uh, but Vassar, Bates, Kenyon, these are just a few examples that have relatively high acceptance rates. They're still selective, right? Um, but are accessible. Um, that being said, liberal arts schools have their own profile that they look for among students. Another option is what we call public ID. So these are public universities uh, like Berkeley, for example, right, um, that are extremely well resourced, extremely high quality education. Uh, three that came to mind that you guys might not be as familiar with are UVA, UNC Chapel Hill, and Wisconsin. Right? Um, even though these schools have a larger student body, uh, within them, they have what we call honors colleges, which is like an elite school within the larger school, which you apply to separately. Um, so this is where research comes in and planning early. Oh, I jumped to my point. Um, so yes, the earlier the better, right? Uh, there's a lot of writing involved, a lot of preparation. Uh, so generally, we're starting right around now. Yeah, this right season. around now. So yeah, we have uh, around eight to nine months to actually um, round off everything together. Um, as you may have noticed, there are many different spaces and parts to the common now. For example, the activities list, the additional info, um, resume, visual portfolio, the videos, the essays themselves. So with these different parts, I think um, the student and the counselor has to plan very carefully what sort of image, what sort of information they want to include. Because we don't want to keep repeating the same stories throughout the whole application, but right? we want to keep surprising the admissions reader. So every new section that he goes to, he learns something new about the student, right? So we have to strategize this carefully. A good way I think about it, it's like pieces of a puzzle. So you have the classes that the student took, the activities that they're a part of, their, if they took exams, their scores on the exams, their essays. And as Mew said, each of these fit together to give a profile, right? Um, but it takes time. It takes time to develop these out and to fit them together. So the earlier we start, the better. Um, to think back to the early decision and early action deadlines, um, November, October, comes pretty fast, right? So the sooner you start, the better. And there are some nitty gritty technical parts uh, in the application as well. So for example, um, you know, filling in like the UC self-reported grades, you need to really allow time for the students to actually learn the system and make sure that the information is done um, accurately. Right? So it's, it's never too early to start. Um, and it can be done, this is the UC yeah. application, it looks like, uh, at any time. For other universities, it's the Common App, right? So it's never too early to open a Common App account and kind of play around with it, right? Familiarize yourself with it. This is what an activities list might look like, uh, what a resume could be, and also video portfolio. Uh, one thing you might notice when you look at the activities, uh, the descriptions. Well, number one, actually, before I get to the descriptions, is the length of time, 
right? Uh, they are going to look at that, how long the student has been involved. Obviously, longer is better, right, to show commitment. Uh, another one is the role. This is, as you mentioned, a leadership role. Were you the president? Were you the treasurer, right? Um, how did you show initiative? And then thirdly, the description, as you can see, is quite short, which is hard because you have to get the point across very, very quickly, right? It can be elaborated on later, but it must come through in the activities description as well. Yes, sir. So, Romy, you mentioned earlier that uh, we should build on like maybe four or five sort of, um, activities uh, mm -hmm. in the profile. How would you allocate uh, four or five spots? Uh, let's say you mentioned a project, internship, maybe competitions, or I think you also, you talk about projects a lot, but how would you allocate those five spots? Um, well, there's two different factors. Uh, the main thing is I would look at is you want to show range. So you don't necessarily, one thing you don't want is for all of your four or five to be variations on the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it would be good to have one that's kind of, for example, research oriented, right? Uh, another one which is benefiting like social work, you know, benefiting a marginalized group. Mm -hmm. uh, a third one could be, for example, environmental, right? Mm -hmm. So we want that range of different activities, right? Mm -hmm. um, that being said, and this is a tricky part, is even though they have different, uh, like each might have a different focus, there's also a common thread between them coming from the student themselves, right? Because like, why? This is a question colleges are curious about. Why are you doing this, you know? Why are you planting the trees? Is it just to get into college? You know, we don't want that. So to answer your question, sir, it's a lot of it's about the range, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also the depth, how much, how did they develop it? And, and how about the type of activities? And uh, you meant, let's say, it, um, I think you, you have identified the areas that you want to maybe work on, you're interested in. But um, let's say, would you um, say that do, going to a competition for that the type of um, kind of activity or um, doing internship in that area or coming up with a project, how would you kind of um, advise a student? Let's say it, um, she he or she has a specific amount of time or limited amount of time, which kind of activities that uh, they should pursue? Well, if, if it's a limited amount of time, right, there are certain things that can be done relatively quickly, right? Uh, for example, summer courses are often two to three weeks if you apply in advance, mm -hmm. right? Um, internships can be done relatively quickly as mm -hmm. well, right? Um, but uh, ideally, you start early, right? So one of the first things we do with students that join us is start brainstorming these activities years in advance, right? To help plan make a groundwork. And I guess to build on Rally's point on range, I think think about what the student will gain from doing a certain activity. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be gaining the same thing. So the key five activities, we don't want to see five researchers because essentially mm -hmm. the skill that the student gets is going to be the same. Mm -hmm. But we want to see maybe one that's very academic, so doing independent research. Mm -hmm. Another one might be something that shows a bit of initiative, a bit of creativity, mm -hmm. like um, having that own passion project or having that own, um, like running their own charity event or mm -hmm. organizing something with themselves, right? The, the third one might be something that deals a lot with teamwork. So perhaps being uh, a leader of a club uh, or teaching at a community college or like a rural school. So that means that they have to work with a wide range of people, for example. Yeah.